Bell's, in fact, gone, gone down, so yeah, so there's a division, uh, so I'm going to have to leave and, and vote. But let me just introduce the, the next speaker, uh, if I may, first of all, that is um, <coughs> JJ Bowler. He's an asylum seeker from the Democratic Republic of uh, Congo, and a poet who wrote the poem called Refuge. Now, as, as an MP in Derby North, uh, one of the biggest areas of case work that I deal with is with asylum seekers who are getting a, a very raw deal. Uh, from the authorities, and it seems as an MP, you know, we're kind of very often seemingly banging my head against a brick wall to try and get a decent service for uh, asylum seekers. And uh, maybe you can be able to give us uh, his perspective from a, uh, a asylum seeker in terms of you know, how it impacts on, on his life. So I'm afraid I'm going to have to go and vote, so I won't be able to hear it all. I'll get back as soon as I possibly can at all of uh, JJ's uh, contribution. But where is JJ? Yeah. Okay, there you go, JJ. Over to you, mate. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to speak a little bit about my experience as both um, an asylum seeker, a refugee in this country, and that kind of process of immigration and the stigma stigmatization of the people. So. Um, just a bit of background, my family came into um, the UK as asylum seekers and got refugee status um, after 11 years, so this is in 1992, from the Democratic Republic of Congo. And anyone who knows a bit about the history of Congo knows that there's been a lot of conflict. Um, and the time that my family left was during the dictatorial regime of the then President Mobutu, and which lasted 32 years. And, and so. When we came over here into the UK, I obviously was a very young boy. Didn't understand a lot of what was going on politically, let alone just in terms of my own experience. And having grown up here, what I've understood is that there seems to be a, a lot of stigma in relation to both asylum seekers and refugees. So what happens generally is that there, there is a label that's applied. So it what it does is it creates this kind of idea of the other. So if you don't fit into the category of what is quintessentially English, so the way you speak or your culture or the way you dress, then you immediately become put into this kind of category as other. And I found that I got to see both ends of the spectrum. So obviously you can tell from my accent that I don't necessarily sound like someone who would be a refugee because you're supposed to have an accent or dress a certain way or look a certain way even. So I looked very much like I was brought up here and a very typical kind of London boy. But what I experienced a lot of times when the immigration issue was brought up was that there was an immediate stigmatization of who is considered to be a refugee and that often, as you see with um, the, the go home vans and the immigration police, is that it becomes racialized. So they're policing areas that are, very, that are high in ethnic minorities in order to kind of enforce a certain pressure in those communities to almost remind them that you will never really fit in into this society and that this society doesn't really belong to you if you are considered other. So my own experience in regards to that, I started to look into a bit of um, the research and statistics. And you know, this year has been the highest year for um, refugees and asylum seekers globally. So there's been 15 million people who've been made refugees around the world. 1.1 million of them, uh, sorry, so 15 million refugees in the world. The UK has 0 0.27 refugees living here at the moment. So, of, so you can imagine, right, the big kind of fury that the media makes of the, the refugees and they're all coming to take our jobs and go back to where you come from. It only accounts for 0.27%. And actually, 80% of refugees, so 80% of the 15 million, that's just this, this year, are actually housed in developing countries. And the highest of that is in Pakistan. So really, if anyone should be actually making the most noise about go back to where you came from, it should be people in Pakistan and not really here because it doesn't affect it in that way. So it's almost creating this separation that people buy into. And if you kind of look at the mainstream media, what it does is it de dehumanizes the experience that people have if you get labelled as a refugee, you're no longer a person with actual experiences and so on. So this is why I try to use art and poetry to kind of like bring that to life. And I do have a poem called Refuge, which I originally uh, planned to perform, but it is about five minutes long, so I would be breaking uh, my time. Well, what I wanted to do... <laughs> Did you find that? Um, I, I don't, do you want me yeah, to? Yeah. Okay, so, all right, so... Um, 
Can I stand? Should I just sit yes, here? Stand. Okay, all right, brilliant. So a bit of performance poetry that's been sanctioned by the artist himself. <laughs> um, so this poem is called Refuge. And it's just about my experience as uh, a young refugee coming into the UK and growing up here. Imagine how it feels to be chased out of home, to have your grip ripped, loosened from your fingertips, something you so dearly held onto. Like a lover's hand that slips when it is pulled away, you are always reaching. My father would speak of home, reaching. Speaking of familiar faces, the girl next door who would eventually grow up to be my mother, the fruit seller at the market, the lonely man at the top of the road who nobody spoke to, and our house at the bottom of the street, lit up by a single flickering lamp where beyond was only darkness there. They would sit and tell stories of monsters that lurked and came only at night, to catch the children who listen to stories of monsters that lurk, this is how they lived. Each memory buried, an artifact left to be discovered by archaeologists, the last words on the dying family member's lips, this was sacred. But not even monsters could taint it. But there were monsters who came during the day, monsters who tore families apart with their giant hands and fingers that slept on triggers, the sound of gunshots ripping through the sky became familiar like the tapping of rainfall on the windowsill, monsters that were killed and hide behind speeches, suits and tires, monsters that would chase families away, forcing them to leave everything behind. I remember when we first stepped off the plane. Everything was foreign, unfamiliar, uninviting. Even the air in my lungs left me short of breath. We came here to find refuge. They called us refugees. So we hid ourselves in their language until we sounded just like them, changed the way we dressed to look just like them, made this our home until we lived just like them, and began to speak of familiar faces, the girl next door who would eventually grow up to be a mother, the fruit seller at the market, the lonely man at the top of the road who nobody spoke to, and our house at the bottom of the street, lit up by a single flickering lamp to keep away the darkness there. We would sit and watch police that came and left only at night to catch the youths who sat and watch police that came. This is how we lived. I remember one day I heard them say to me, they come here to take our jobs. They need to go back to where they came from. Not knowing that I was one of the ones who came, I told them that a refugee is simply someone who is trying to make a home. So next time, when you go to sleep, tuck your children in and kiss your families goodnight. Be glad that the monsters never came for you in their suits and ties, never came for you in the newspapers where the media lies, never came for you, that you are not despised. And deep inside the hearts of each and every one of us, we are all always reaching for a place that we can call home. Thank you. Okay, Chris doesn't come back yet.